My name is Sylvia Morgan. I'm the Chief of Police, and I appreciate y'all coming in today so that we can say thank you to not only some officers that have done some extraordinary things, but some citizens as well that have helped us. And also, we're going to honor the Officer of the Year and our Employee of the Year as well today. So we're going to get started with uh, a case that involved Darren McCartney, Doug Pipkins, Rich Coleman, and Matt Bain. If you guys would all come up here. You can all stand on display. Over here is better, I think. Right, whichever is your good side, yeah. <clears throat> all right, so in November of last year, 2017, we, um, uh, patrol officers got a uh, check welfare, well, not a check welfare car, they wanted to locate someone. This was the Upper McCungie Township Police in Pennsylvania and the Pennsylvania State Police. They were looking for an individual that might have some information about a woman that was missing back in Pennsylvania. So he was supposed to be at the hospital, at President's Hospital, so patrol officer uh, was sent there, Darren McCartney. Um, he was able to get some information from the Pennsylvania police about the family and their concerns about where their daughter was, that, he, that this gentleman had been in a relationship with her on and off possibly, and that, that, that he might have some information she'd been missing for a few days. So after getting some information, he went to interview this subject and um, kind of had a real, had picked up on some inconsistencies in his story, he kept changing his story, and multiple signs of kind of deception, he wasn't really making sense. So um, Darren, being the keen officer that he is, is like, ah, there's something more going on with this, I need to get the investigators involved. So he called the investigations division. In comes Rich Coleman and Doug Pipkins, they're both investigators here. And so they responded to the hospital, and there, um, after a very long and taxing interview, um, trying to sort through what this guy was saying, and he wasn't making sense sometimes, they were able to get a confession from him that he had actually murdered his girlfriend, and that she was back in his trailer in Pennsylvania. And it, it was, I'm not going to get into all the details, but it was quite a horrific murder the way he went through in great detail telling them how he had done this. And so obviously that was, was going to be of huge importance to the case back in Pennsylvania. Meanwhile, Sergeant Bain, who was the sergeant in investigations at the time, was not only having to take care of his normal duties as a sergeant in investigations, he was fairly new to the division. And his lieutenant, who would normally be helping out in these sort of things by handling the media and those sorts of things, was off at a management school. So he wasn't anywhere around to be able to actually help out with this case. So you have Sergeant Bain back trying to talk to the state's attorney's office and the Pennsylvania State Police and trying to deal with the media and handle all the kind of things that go on behind the scenes and trying to coordinate all of this. So ultimately an arrest warrant was obtained for him through Pennsylvania. He was extradited back there. and. But I, I, I think that obviously when this goes to trial, they're all going to get a trip to Pennsylvania, I think. But besides that, obviously their training experience and expertise in this was vital to this investigation and ultimately the um, going to be vital to the prosecution of the murderers. So I want to present you guys with certificates of merit. Darren, you're first. We got to post our pictures and stuff. Richard, it's a bad angle. Doug? Rich, there you go. Just, I gotta figure out a better angle for the pictures. Like, all right, Matt. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> Guys, go sit down. Thank you. All right. Next, I like uh, Ornella to come up. I'm not even going to try to pronounce your last name. I'll just mess it up. There would be other people standing here with you, but Dwayne Smith, who is one of our investigators, was unable to be here. And then Pastor Burwell, who's moved to Florida now, correct? Yeah, he was, he was obviously not able to be here. So in November of 2017, November was a busy month, um, the Urbana police responded to the death of an infant. And the family that, was, that, that had the death in the, in the family was from another country. So they didn't have any family, they didn't really have any friends um, that were close by to assist them. 
uh, in addition, they had a three-year-old child as well. So in kind of all of the confusion and grief and being overwhelmed with the situation, um, they, they really needed to go to the hospital to be with the baby before the coroner came in and, and took custody of the baby and stuff. But they didn't know what to do with the three-year-old. So uh, investigator Dwayne Smith was there. He recognized the family as being uh, one of their uh, church, one of his church family. He didn't really know them very well, but he knew that they went to his same church. So he recognized that there was kind of this problem, you know, and that maybe he could reach out to the pastor and who could help in some way try to get the logistics of all of this to work. So he, he contacted Pastor Burwell, who's not able to be here. He immediately went to work trying to call people to get somebody that might be able to help out with the situation. Ultimately, he was able to get in touch with Ornella, who immediately agreed to assist. And selflessly, she went to take care of the three-year-old for several hours that it took for the, the family to be able to deal with what they had to deal with. So I think that, that obviously was something that was very heartwarming to the family. It was very important to them that they were able to do that and felt like that their, their three-year-old child was being taken care of <coughs> Excuse me, in the, in the interim. So it, I, I am very thankful to work in a community where we have citizens that are willing to do this, to reach out in somebody's, <coughs> in their, in their uh, time of need. And, and the kindness and compassion and selflessness is so greatly appreciated. And I want to make sure that you are thanked for that. So I want to give you this certificate of appreciation. It's a letter to go with it as well. Thank you so much. All right. Mr. Spindler, you're next. Absolutely. I, I don't know why I like people on this side, but I appreciate you cooperating with that. Whatever you say, Chief. All right, so in September of 2017, he happens to be from the same church, uh, by the way. Stone Creek. I know, Stone Creek Church, are amazing. All right, so in September of 2017, we, uh, the police department responded to a missing adult female who had some cognitive disabilities. She lived in a group home down in South Urbana, and she had gone with some of the other residents to the mire, which is something that they did fairly often. So when the others returned back from the store, she was not with them. And so the, the group home uh, was, became very concerned about where she was. They waited a few hours before they called the police, but she never returned, so they ultimately called us, made the report, and officers were able to look at the video at Meyer and saw that she kind of walked off the property, but they didn't see what happened to her after that. She, she got, ended up ultimately, we found out later, got disoriented and wasn't able to find her way back home, and she ended up kind of on the side of the road, and, she, the, and the temperatures dropped into the 40s overnight, and she was gone all night long. So early morning, I don't know what time you go to work out, yeah, but it's, it's like early. Five something in the morning. Yeah, five something in the morning. You're on your way to work out, and you see her on the side of the road. It's true. And you stopped. You thought something's not right. Yeah. Talked to her. She seemed disoriented yeah. still. Um, I don't know that she would have ever been able to find her way back home. No. Um, she was so no. disoriented. So you were you were there. You were her savior that day, and you helped her get yeah. back home safely. Yeah, that's true. And that and so I, I wanted to say that your willingness to get involved, some people. I don't know how, who knows how many people drove by yeah. and didn't stop yeah. and didn't and just thought, oh, I don't know what that person's doing or why they're there, but didn't want to be involved in that. So I want to say yeah. that I'm very grateful that you stopped to help her and that you helped her find her way home. Yeah. I appreciate it. Appreciate that. Get that off of there. They like to take pictures yeah, and stuff. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. Jared Hurley here. There he is. Why are you in the hallway? You're trying to hide. All right, Jared. In the winter of 2017 and 18, um, some of you may know that we started experiencing a high number of residential burglaries in South Urbana. So as it goes with these things uh, like this, sometimes it takes a little bit of time before we kind of recognize that something, you know, there's kind of a trend going on. Cause you know, we'll have burglaries from time to time on a regular basis. So ultimately, Jared here started kind of putting this together. He'd taken some reports and he was able to identify some evidence. He ended up speaking to our crime analyst who was able to 
extract some of the specific information that Jared gave her that's not easily extracted normally. And was able to put that into kind of more of an advanced search in the database. So she was able to actually link together multiple burglaries that had like one or, one or more pieces of evidence that were kind of starting to be like a, a pattern for us. So you were, you were one of the, you were the first person that came to her and tried to ask for her assistance to help in trying to figure out what was going on with these burglaries. You identified a shoe impression, was able to locate the actual type of shoe it was that was involved in the burglaries, and then there was a red jacket that was involved as well. You put all this information out to patrol so people could start watching out for anybody wearing this red jacket, anybody that you might deal with that has these shoes on. This was a horrible time for the residents because in South Urbana because that's all everybody talked about because we were having so many of these burglaries. Um, so you put all this information, you get it out to patrol officers, you did a canvas of the neighborhoods around some of these areas saying, look, this is what to look out for, call us if you see any of this, telling them about the red jacket and those sorts of things. So we were able to have some citizens call in when they started seeing stuff. Ultimately, we were able to make two arrests in early February. One of those arrests, was, they confessed to multiple burglaries that had occurred and sentenced uh, within less than two weeks, I believe, 10 days, nine days, something like that, was sentenced to the Juvenile Department of Corrections for the burglaries. And lo and behold, I don't remember how many burglaries like literally dropped off, like almost non-existent over the next few weeks. Is that right, Melissa? Yeah, I don't have the exact numbers, but they were like almost nothing. So I just want to say that I appreciate the extra time you put into this case. I know everybody in Urbana appreciates the extra time that you put in. It was vital to kind of link in all this together and getting all this information together for the patrol officers. So I just want to say thank you very much for thank that. Thank you. All right, we got a little picture here. Thank you. Thank you. All right. This is Billy Nash here. Ah, fantastic. Hi, Billy. Thanks, thanks for coming. All right. So in January of this year, you were in your house, minding yes. your own business, and you heard some loud yelling outside. So you look outside to see what's going on. You saw a male and a female near a, a vehicle nearby your house. And um, you saw the male kind of grab the female and shove her into the car, slam the door. He went around to get into the car. She jumps out of the car, clearly trying to get away. He goes back around, shoves her in the car again. He goes around to the vehicle, uh, to the driver's side, jumps out again, tries to get away. He gets her the third time, and this time he hits her in the face, knocks her to the ground, correct? Yeah. Hit her so hard, knocked her to the ground. At that point, you're like, ooh, I'm going to call the police. So calls 911. Um, he was able to pull her up off the ground, shove her into a car, slam the door again. This time she stays in the vehicle and they drive off. So you did an excellent job reporting to the police officers like the description of the male and the female and the car and what had happened. Um, even the fact that she'd fallen down and her purse had fallen and things had fallen out of her purse and became important later when they were talking to them because officers did respond and they were able to find the vehicle and the people involved and the female denied that anything had happened. And this is not uncommon in these situations. For whatever reason, they're unable, for multiple reasons, unable to get out of an abusive situation or whatever. And they'll deny any kind of an abuse. So when we have an independent witness that tells us exactly what happened, it becomes very important so that we can try to help extract them from those situations. So all of that played a role in the, the officers being able to make an arrest of the male for what he had done. So obviously, you're willing to get involved when somebody's, yeah. somebody's welfare is in, in jeopardy, and we appreciate that. But not only that, the, there was a case in the court system because the female did have children involved. And so now that we have children involved in an abusive situation, which is even worse. So the, through the court system, there's, there's uh, cases that they take the, it's different than the, the trial part of it, but it involves the children and their well-being. And you were able to come in and testify as to what you had seen that day. In, in that particular hearing as well. So all of that is in an effort to keep the children safe. And I just want to say that you know we can't do some of this without people that are willing to come forward and tell us what they see and to help people in the, the situations that when they cannot help themselves. And I just want to say how much we appreciate your help. Thank you. I'm give you this certificate. This letter behind there. So that's a nice little picture. Thank you so much, Billy. All right, is Officer Frank Amont here? There he is. Hey, 
Hi. How are you doing? Um, great. Fantastic. Great. Unfortunately, he was involved in a car accident a few days ago on duty, so we're not sure what's going on with this here yet, but we hope it's nothing seri too serious. So it's kind of scary. But this is about something else. All right, this is about a great work you did. That wasn't his fault. A, actually, a drunk driver hit, the, hit him, and so that was uh, unfortunate. But back in February in 2018, you were patrolling near a local hotel where we have a lot of problem, drug problems. Um, in fact, we've had some heroin overdoses there that are a big concern for us. You see a vehicle driving without headlights, pull into the hotel, so you decide to, to uh, do a traffic stop on them. Initially, the vehicles like start and stop and kind of acting like they may try to flee from you. You're able to kind of contain them in the parking lot, get out with them. There's five occupants in the vehicle. You smelled cannabis coming from the vehicle. You get your back up there, and ultimately you're going to search. You search the vehicle. All right. So located inside the vehicle was over an ounce. Excuse me. Over an ounce of cannabis was packaged in individual packages. Two scales used to weigh the, the, the cannabis, packaging, other packaging material used to package the, the cannabis, and two handguns. But just as scary as the two handguns were two black face masks. And um, when you have guns and face masks together, you don't know what people are going to be doing with them. So it's bad enough with the guns. Five occupants, ultimately you arrested. There was one adult, four juveniles. All of them are arrested and taken, taken to, into custody. Um, obviously, you got two guns off the street, but there's really no way of telling what crimes you prevented by taking them all to jail and getting those guns off the street. I obviously had other intentions that night, um, not only with the guns, but the face masks. So your diligence in recognizing problems area, problem areas in the city and working on, those, on solutions for those problems is something that's very important to the citizens. And I just want to say I appreciate that. I can't shake your hand, apparently. <laughs> Not today. We're still going to post for a picture, though, John. Thank you so much, John. All right. Melissa Haynes. All right. This is Melissa Haynes. She's our crime analyst. She's only been employed here since August of 2016. It seems like so much longer than that. <laughs> That's probably because she hit the ground running like that, and it was one thing after another being thrown at her, literally. She's not disagreeing with me. All right, so not only does she do administrative and tactical and strategic analysis for the police department, but she also does it for some outside groups that, that we're involved with, that we collaborate with, including the crisis intervention team and the CU Fresh Start program, those, all those things that she, she's worked, collaborated with. She was also vital in forming a collaboration of multidisciplinary team of U University of Illinois professors, and she led an effort to write a grant to the National Institute of Justice. And so this was a grant, I'll probably get some of this wrong, but it was a grant that was for larger cities to look at kind of how their policing strategies and how they police in certain neighbors, neighborhoods where there are lots of, called hot spots, where there's lots of police activity, lots of crime. And she never thought we were going to get this, honestly. She thought that we're too small, they're not going to look at this, it's, you know, and, and really didn't think that we were going to get this grant. But we did. She, I just want to, I know she worked with the U of I too, but she literally led the way in getting this grant. So not only can it imp improve our police citizen relationships, but it could be used to improve police practices across the nation. It'll be something that will be published and will be looked at by other police departments. So she developed and in, implemented an internship program. She's like, oh, I can get some free help. I'll go to the U of I and I'll get some interns to help me. And so they've been able to help you do analysis on domestics and shooting and property crimes and those sorts of things so that she can do all these things that she you know, wants to get accomplished. She researched and coordinated the purchasing of a mapping software, which has been a huge help with us in looking at the, the IDOT traffic study and in kind of just literally kind of showing officers like where we're having the most problems and with traffic accidents and crime patterns and all of those things. Um, not in addition to all the work that she does here for the police department that she gets paid for, she also does some volunteering. She's kind of enjoyed going to 
um, help out with the Special Olympics and she went to the dunk tank over at the Sweet Corn Festival and she got dunked voluntarily to help raise money for Special Olympics. She dressed up in costume and went over to the library this year for their Halloween party and interacted obviously with the kids but helped judge the costume contest they had over there. So I, I just, I don't, I say this a lot, like we, we need Melissa, like we gotta, we gotta be nice to Melissa, don't just leave Melissa, to let Melissa be alone, go through Bob, everybody wants to just throw a bunch of stuff at her, we gotta, we gotta keep Melissa, we love Melissa, she is vital to this police department and the short period of time that she's been here, and so it's an honor to give her the Civilian Employee of the Year Award. This is a coin for you. Now we have to pose for a picture. <laughs> Thank you, Melissa. All right, Betsy, it's your turn. This is Betsy Alfonso. She just recently had a baby. He's amazing. He's so cute and he's over there sleeping. All right, so did, uh, Betsy Alfonso is the John E. Lockard Officer of the Year. So John was here, there he is, John's here. He retired after 44 years at the police department, right? right. How many as an officer, 30? 29. 29 as an officer and then he became our evidence technician. And we'd never had anybody work here that long, so we were so amazed <laughs> that somebody worked here that long that we named the Officer of the Year Award after him. He's a great guy, I'm just joking. I'm just messing with him. All right, so in December of 2010, Betsy became employed at the Urbana Police Department and worked as a patrol officer. In 2015, she was selected to be a field training officer for the department. And in June of 2016, she was chosen to go to the Criminal Investigations Division as a juvenile detective. Since she's been in the Criminal Investigations Division, she's worked on several high-profile cases, one of which, I think early on in your, in your tenure there, you uh, worked a case where there were two brothers that um, were, had just been a part of CU Fresh Start call-in and were shooting guns in Nirvana. And so you worked that case, ultimately both of them were convicted and sent to prison. So that was just one example of some of the, the, the cases she's handled up there since she's been there. She does handle most juvenile related cases and referrals to the Youth, uh, youth Assessment Center is a, a place where we refer juveniles because we can't always take them to jail. So we have the Youth <coughs> Assessment Center, they refer them for services and try to figure out other ways of trying to help families deal with problem use and, and use that have you know some special needs. So she also works on child sex crimes, which can be especially difficult and challenging whenever you have to deal with children that are being abused, either sexually or physically. She's an extremely compassionate and caring person. In the case I spoke of earlier, when the family lost their infant child and had the three-year-old, she, she worked, was involved in that case as well. She referred the three-year-old to the Shop with a Cop program that for that that Christmas time so that the family could have some some presents and have something special for the three-year-old. The family was so help, so thankful for everything she did to help them that she's brought they brought you meals to, to yeah, say thank you much. for that. Yeah, so so that just shows like exact exactly how much that meant to them. So outside of here, Betsy does an extremely large amount of volunteer work. Now maybe it doesn't seem like to you, but it does to us. You, you mentor a young girl and you have for several years. Seven years. Ah, seven years. Yeah, so, so she, um, she mentors her, so every week, at least during the school year, every week, and in the summer, and in the summer too, all right? So she um, recently, well, I don't know how recently it was, but had an interview that she needed to go to, and so Betsy kind of helped her with how to deal with that situation and bought her some clothes that would be appropriate for the interview. Mm -hmm. And so I, it was very important, the mentorship program, if you're not familiar with, in, in the school system here is just absolutely amazing. Um, she's also volunteered to be the, in the Shop with a Cop program with our officers every Christmas. She does the fundraisers for Special Olympics, not just Cop on Top and the Torch Run, the Polar Plunge, the Dunk Tank at the Sweet Corn Festival, multiple fundraising events. She even got an award from them. I don't know exactly what it was called, but she got an award from Special Olympics for all of the, the, the stuff that she's done to help raise funds for them. <clears throat> and I don't think I could say it any better than her supervisor, Lieutenant Searles, because I'm, so I'm going to read what he wrote when he won. Okay. You were nominated by multiple people, but 
when he, one of the things he wrote, was, I couldn't say any better. She simply is one of the nicest and happiest people I have ever met. She intentionally chooses to remain positive and cheerful even when times are difficult. She, poses many of this, she possesses many of the same person, personality attributes of John Lockhart, for whom the award is now named. The Urbana Police Department is a better place because of Betsy. It's an honor to present you with John E. Lockhart, Officer of the Award. Now we have to step on, I guess we're we'll, <laughs> and here's a challenge point for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, that's all I got for you guys today.